This greenish thing is an example of a ZIF socket, a zero insertion force socket. It allows you to insert and remove a classic dip package IC, the one found in most retro electronics, quickly and easily using virtually no force. This yellowish thing is my Commodore 64 tester machine. You might remember it from my very first video, a sort of trashed treasure story. This C64 has become my faithful workbench repair companion. I call this my C64 tester machine because I always have it at the bench with me and I use it mainly for chip swapping. I'm confident that these ICs function perfectly with this motherboard so I can use it as a baseline when you're working on those really difficult Commodore 64 repairs when all you have is a black screen and you feel backed into a corner and you're not sure what's going on. I can start pulling ICs and swapping to try to narrow down which ones are faulty and which ones aren't. And this is where my ZIF socket idea comes into play. Repeatedly pulling and reinserting these old ICs must add a lot of stress to their legs. So I'm thinking replace all these major chips with ZIF sockets. That way I'll be able to remove and replace these known good ICs quickly and easily anytime I want. And going into this, my intention is to replace as many of the Commodore 64 major IC sockets as I can. I think a good initial idea is to dry fit the ZIF sockets over top of the existing sockets to make sure that everything is going to fit properly, which it isn't already. Wonderful. I hope this idea doesn't turn into a zero insertion farce. Okay, we've run into a few issues on the dry fit. The first being I can't fit a ZIF socket over the kernel ROM or the CIA chips on the top left of your screen. And of course, things get a bit more complicated down below. Even though these ZIF sockets fit horizontally, they will not fit flush against the surface of the motherboard because of existing components, like these ceramic disc capacitors. Adding one more challenge into the mix. Surprise! I've decided I'm going to do this in smaller steps by replacing the CPU, the PLA, and the VIC chip only at the moment. I've selected these three chips for a couple of reasons. First, because they're the most common ones that I would swap out, and two, there aren't many components on the board to deal with in the immediate area around them. Let's fire up the desoldering gun, and while it's heating up, we're going to take a look at the board and what we need to do to get these old sockets off. First we have to look at removing the metal back shield from the bottom of the motherboard. The metal tabs of the back shield wrap up and around and are usually soldered to the ground plane of the motherboard. I desoldered these a while ago when I recapped this motherboard and I never soldered them back. Now I haven't noticed an issue having not done that and for this particular project it makes things a little bit easier because I just have to go around the board and bend the pins away from it and take off the back shield. Everything looks A-OK -okay on the back. I'm just going to flip it upright one more time and remove the ICs from the sockets that we're going to be desoldering. So the VIC, PLA, and CPU need to be pulled. Okay, it's desolder time, and on the bottom I put two strips of painter's tape on either side of the CPU socket, because that's the first one I'm going to desolder, and I want to make sure I stay on course. Here we go. soldering gun pit stop already. It clogged while well, the nozzle clogged. This is a one millimeter diameter nozzle. 
And if you don't clean it out after every session by using the little ramrod wire that comes with it, that little hole will clog up. And in this case, it looked like it was gummed up with old rosin. It took me an hour to clean it out. So pro tip, clean your tools. Okay, let's continue. A little macro action shows that we've done a pretty good job of desoldering all those pins. And I will continue on with the other sockets. All done. The VIC-2 area is ready for a ZIF, and so is the PLA and the CPU. You'll notice I lost a little bit of conformal coating around pin 14 of the PLA socket. That's because pin 14 is a ground, and it's right on that large ground plane, and required extra heat and dwell time to get the solder to melt. Now, it's not a huge deal in this case because it's a ground, but be weary if you're desoldering sockets or ICs from these old boards because overheating any of the other pads will definitely damage traces. Okay, let's get a ZIF socket in here and see what we've got. This is a 28 pin ZIF socket and it should drop in perfectly. Maybe. There. Uh oh. Oh, that's better. But still a bit wobbly because of that cap. I guess it's time to do some reshaping. There's a fair bit of extra material at the base of these zip sockets, so what I'm going to do is carefully mark exactly where that cap is touching it, and hopefully I can file down that area. All right, file is out. Zip socket is marked, and what I'm going to do is carefully file in between where I've marked. Yeah, and that was actually easier than I thought. And hopefully I've made enough space so that capacitor will fit through there and the zip socket will mount nice and flush against the surface of the motherboard. And here's our completed reshaped ZIF socket. Looks pretty good. And just a quick note, when installing these things, make sure you do so with the locking handle in the up position, because if you notice, when it's locked in the down position, the pins sort of tighten up on an angle. So it's better to make sure that the handle is up, pins are straight, and you can insert hopefully easily into the board. Just like that. Or that. There, that's perfect. There's still maybe a tiny bit of a wobble, but I think I'm happy with this. Here's a better view of it. And now I'll fit the other ZIF sockets the same way. This is the ZIF socket for the VIC-2, and you can see it required a little bit more of a creative sculpting approach. And of course, similar work was done to the CPU ZIF socket check out that notch for the resistor. Okay, finally, it's solder time. So I'm going to put some flux along the pins. Like so. And start soldering. The three ZIF sockets have been soldered in place, and let's take a look. Beauty! Looks really good. The orientation of the ZIF sockets is not random. I did put them in these positions so that the locking arms are free to move up and down and not be hindered by anything else on the board, especially when in the lock position. I'm happy with how everything looks and feels, so now it's time to do a little bit of a flex cleanup.
And here's our completed ZIF socket partial retrofit. And we'll put all the ICs back in their respective slots. Nice, how easy is that? Here's a closer look and everything looks really good. Quite happy how it turned out. I do plan to mark the ZIF sockets with some form of indication to make sure that the orientation of the ICs is correct when they're being inserted. Well, now that I'm on a bit of a roll, I think I'm going to take on one more little challenge. I really would like a ZIF socket for the SID chip, but because these two capacitors at the top and the one at the bottom are so close to the socket, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to this one. I'm going to relocate the top two caps to the underside of the board. To speed things along, I've added some fresh solder to the legs of those capacitors on the bottom side of the board, and I'll let the desoldering gun work its magic. The two caps are out, and I can now fit them on the bottom and solder them in. And I will use the handy blue tack technique to hold these capacitors in place so when I flip the board over, everything's going to stay put. And I opted to add a little bit of shrink tubing on this one for good measure. Here's the SID ZIF socket completed. And now the SID can be inserted. You'll see I did have to do a little bit of filing at the bottom to fit that other capacitor, but everything looks good. Okay, now our ZIF socket partial retrofit is ready to be tested. I have my trusty diagnostics cartridge, which I will insert. The diagnostic harness is already in place, and we'll throw the switch. And it works! Yay! No errors. I don't know if you heard that or not, but I'm hearing a pop sound when either the SID voices change or the volume changes. I'm not sure what's going on. It's a little unusual. Okay, I've done some further testing and I'm pretty sure it has something to do with the volume level changing within the SID. So I've written a little program here that's going to cycle through all the volume levels of the SID chip. Zero being no volume, 15 being full volume. It will cycle through these one at a time print the value to the screen, wait a tenth of a second, and begin the cycle over again, and hopefully we can reproduce the pop sound. So let's run it. So what's that about? Granted, I have the microphone right up to the speakers and the speaker volume cranked, but you can hear a pop on every volume level change. And the one that really stands out is when the volume is set to zero. That's the loudest, most defined pop that was most noticeable for me. So what's causing this? I'm not really sure. Is it because I moved the two caps to the bottom of the board? Is the ZIF socket itself causing some kind of a problem? Is it because I'm using new speakers? I don't know, and I'm not going to obsess over it very much either. Having said that, if anyone watching has any theories and think they might know what's wrong, let me know in the comments below. Was this a zero insertion farce? Absolutely not. All in all, I have to say this was a fun and worthwhile exercise. With patience and a little creativity, ZIF sockets can be installed successfully on a Commodore 64 motherboard. At the very least for the four main ICs anyway. 
I am going to wrap up this video here, but so you know, I have ordered some narrow style 16 pin zip sockets because I want to install them on all eight RAM ICs as well. I do hope you enjoyed this video, so please remember to like, share, and comment below. As I mentioned in my previous video, I don't have a Patreon account. I don't think I could pump out the videos at a reasonable rate to justify it to prospective supporters. But I have introduced a PayPal donation link in the descriptions of all my videos. If you find that you enjoyed a particular video and would like to support my Commodore computer rescue and repair efforts, please consider a small donation to this channel. Like most retro computer YouTubers, I really enjoy doing my small part saving our beloved 8-bit computers, and do so in my spare time and at my own expense, so every little bit helps. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks very much for watching, thanks for your time, and I'll see you again soon. This greenish thing is an example of a ZIF socket. A zero inversion.